we were in Revelation chapter 9, and we've been going through the, the seven seals. At the opening of the seventh seal, we make our way into the prelude to the seven trumpets, and that's what we've been going through up until this point. And so last week, we had studied the fifth and sixth trumpets. And now in chapter 10, we'll go into what is called, again, a parenthetical chapter. It's a step back. It's an opportunity for us to have insight and learn a little bit more about what's going on during this time before we get to the seventh trumpet. And within then, the seventh trumpet will have the seven bowls of wrath. And we'll see this again as we go into the seventh bowl. Between the sixth and seventh, there will be another one of these parenthetical chapters where you have a little bit of a pause and some understanding of everything else that's going on during this time. This particular one, however, is the longest that we see. This is the longest pause that we have in between these events. And I know it can be kind of confusing and it's okay. You don't have to have memorized the seven seals and the trumpets and the bowls, but just know that there's a progression that is happening. There's a progression that's happening in the end times, in the period of the tribulation, with each opening of the seal, an event happens. Within the seventh seal, there are trumpets that are being blown. With each blow of a trumpet, more events are happening. And in the last one, if you read there at the end of chapter 9 and verse 13, it says, then the sixth angel sounded. So that's a trumpet, the sixth trumpet being sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses and the vision, and those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And so it's a very sobering end to that chapter, as these are the three woes that are being spoken against the church, the two woes having been completed here. And and with that, what's happening here as these events are unfolding is really what's being communicated to those who are left on earth is There are terrible things about to come upon you, and they are experiencing these things. Yet, amazingly, here, even at the end of this, it says that they didn't repent. They didn't repent of their wicked ways. They didn't see these events and weren't shaken enough by them to have repented from how they were living their lives. And here now we have this pause before we go into the seventh trumpet. And so this is a long pause, as I've mentioned. It's from and we'll only get through chapter 10 tonight. It's a shorter chapter, but quite honestly, we can't, we can't try and do 10 and 11, because 11's tough. 11 is a unique chapter. And so be prepared for next week, because we learn a little bit about these two witnesses that were raised up during this time that prophesy. And so it's just too much to try and go into that tonight. But we have this pause from chapter 10, verse 1, all the way through eleven fourteen, And that's when we'll then go back into the seventh trumpet. And so this pause, yes, It gives us insight. We're going to get a little bit of an understanding of some additional things that are happening. We're going to have John describe to us an angel that comes down from heaven. And most teachers break this particular chapter up into three main points. The first is that there's an angel who comes down from heaven. Who is this angel? What is this angel? Secondly, that it says that there will be no time. Or translated differently, there will be no more delay. And so, no more delay in what? And then finally, that John will be commanded to eat a small book that's in the hands of the angel. And so there's three key events here that we need to understand and look at that give us some insight into what is happening during this time. But this pause is also in line with other pauses that we've seen and speak to the heart of our Father in that there is still more time for repentance. 
That's what we have to see here. And I mentioned this last time that as we consider the book of Revelation, we can look at it and see it as a book of judgment and a book of wrath. For yes, judgment and wrath are contained within. But we can also look at this book and see a book of redemption, a book of reconciliation, a book where we can see the heart of our Father longing and waiting his patience for those who are in sin to turn from their wicked ways. But the time is coming here very soon, and it'll even be hinted at tonight when we hear this angel say there will be no more delay, that that there is coming a point, and, and it's so poignant for us in the midst of everything that's going on in our world. You know, many right now could sit back and say, wow, look at all of these events. And they could start to figure out how to plot these events such that they could say, the end is near. Well, we know without those events that the end is near. But truly, as we look at everything that's going on, it's a reminder to us of this world, and this world is falling away. But there's still time. There is still time, but that time is running out. And that's the the message and the theme we continue to get here from John in this amazing book. And so as we go into chapter 10, if you would, just agree with me in prayer. Father, we pause here tonight, and we do ask for your blessing upon our time of study. Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you that we have the opportunity to come together to study your word, to worship, to praise you, to fellowship. What a blessing that is, Father. What a privilege that is that we have. May we know that here tonight. And Father, give us understanding of your word. Help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives, to take comfort in it, not fear, not anxiety. We're told to comfort one another with these words. We're told to comfort one another with the promise of your return. And that's what this should leave us with, though it should be sobering as we consider the lives that will be lost. Lord, we can take comfort if we know you as our Lord and Savior, knowing that we have the promise of eternity in heaven. And may it propel us, Lord, to share of what we have and what we know with those who are lost around us, Lord. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, Lord, that we have this time, and I ask, Lord, that you'd bless it. And in every aspect of ministry here tonight, Lord, may your spirit move, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation 10, verse 1, we read here first of the mighty angel, the mighty angel with the little book. Verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head and his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. Who is this mighty angel? How many of you think this mighty angel is Jesus? How many of you think it's a mighty angel, just a different angel? We don't know. Don't you love it when I say that, right? How many times have I said that about the book of Revelation? We don't know. And so you could both be right in a sense because he's coming down as a mighty angel. Is this Jesus? Is this the Son of Man? The description certainly sounds like it, does it not? We think back to Revelation chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword in his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And here we have one who's coming down from heaven and he's clothed with a cloud. There's a cloud around him. Remember that prior to this, earlier in chapter 9 with the fifth and sixth trumpets, that the abyss was opened up. The abyss was opened up and terrible things were coming up from the abyss, this deep dark hole within the earth. Smoke was filling the clouds. And now here one is coming through, this angel coming from above and piercing the clouds, clothed in a cloud, a rainbow on his head, his face like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. I mean, that certainly, it doesn't take much to convince me that this absolutely could be Jesus. But there's debate over this. There's debate over it because of what we'll read here shortly, that there's some wording that this angel uses that would make you question, well, is that really Jesus? We also know that within the New Testament, Jesus is never compared to an angel. Now, of course, he is in the Old Testament as an angel of the Lord. We see that, but otherwise, we never really see any description of Jesus as an angel in this way. 
And there's some elements about even the writing. I mean, even our Bibles, at least mine, would suggest that it's probably not Jesus. They don't capitalize any of the terms here, whereas in Revelation chapter 1 they do. It's very clear. It's him. It's a capital H on that one, but not necessarily in this chapter. Now, Pastor Chuck Smith, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's like, this is Jesus. Because look at what this angel does, and we'll see that here shortly. The power that this angel has, the stance that this angel takes that suggests that he has power over all the world. But then there are many others who say, no, I just I just don't know. And I don't want to say it doesn't matter because anything related to Jesus matters, but the reality is, is we don't need to know. We don't have to know. We don't have to have a definitive answer. We can look forward to knowing in time. But you can take your own stance, and you're not necessarily going to be wrong either way. What we do see here about this angel, and now this is another mighty angel. I think the original language here would say another of a different kind than what we had seen before. He had a little book, verse 2, open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. And so here this mighty angel is coming down from heaven. No longer are wicked, terrible things coming up from the center of the earth, but rather now a mighty angel is coming down from heaven. And he has a little book open in his hand. Now, some believe or wonder, is this the scroll? Is this like the lamb that we saw within the throne room of heaven who took the scroll from the right hand of God the Father, seated on the throne? And and is this the scroll now that's in his hand? And it's described very differently. Now, some of the contents that is within this book could be some of the same things that are in the scroll. We have to remember that what we're reading in Revelation is a revealing of things. It's an unveiling of information. We'll hear here shortly that a mystery, the mystery of God is going to be shared, and that's really what the end times are all about. That's what Revelation is all about. It's the culmination of God's plan and purpose. It's the culmination of everything that He has planned. And the things that we don't understand, the things that we want to know, these are all the things that are being unveiled at this time. His plan and purpose is coming to completion. And so it's likely that that is part of what is in this book, and the book is open at this point. And he sets his right foot on the sea. So if it's Jesus, he, you know, he's it's on the sea. Is it sinking into the sea? Is he standing? Is he walking on water again? We don't know. His right foot, though, is on the sea. And so with that, what's more important here is that his right foot is on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And so what this does here is it should give us a picture of something that is, in fact, mighty large, powerful, has a presence. And so if this isn't Jesus, if this is Jesus, then sure, it makes sense. I mean, Jesus can be that mighty, powerful presence. If it's not, then it truly is a mighty angel, an angel who is given great power, an angel who is being given responsibility for communicating something very significant, because what we believe is essentially unfolding here and being communicated is a preview or a precursor to the end of the tribulation, communicating that the end is coming, that time is running out, that with all of this tribulation that has happened, these seals that have been opened, these trumpets that have been blown, these woes that have come upon the earth, that they are beginning to come to an end. And here, as this mighty angel cries with a loud voice, and it's not just a loud voice. I mean, imagine a mighty angel. We can't even imagine it. We can imagine what we can imagine in our own imaginations, (laughs) if that makes sense. But that's very limited. Because outside of a movie or a picture or some artist that's drawn something that you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. I've never seen anything like that. I've never experienced a mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud with a rainbow over his head and the ability to stand both on land and on sea. And so this mighty angel cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And some of you have heard me say this before. Lions are one of the coolest animals out there. Uh, They're biblical animals. (laughs) They're biblical animals. Lion of the tribe of Judah. But when you hear a lion roar, that thing's incredible. I mean, it's just ear-piercing. It's powerful. You can feel it. 
He cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, this wasn't just thunder. This wasn't what we've seen the past couple of nights in our areas. You know, evening comes and we see some lightning coming in. We hear a little bit of thunder. This was powerful. This was more than just a, a storm event. Seven thunders uttered their voices. There was voices coming from the heavens at this point. And it's interesting because we read in Psalm 29, verses 3 through 9, of seven voices of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. In his temple, everyone says, glory. The voice of the Lord. And this is power. This is something like we have never seen or experienced before. This is the voice of the Lord from which came creation and what we enjoy today. You know, it's been said by many that you can see and experience God in nature. And to a degree, yeah, you can. It's his voice that brought it into being. And here now, these voices thunder from heaven. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. Now, what had John been told that he was to do from the beginning of this book? Write it down. Write down a few things. Write down everything, right? So poor John, poor little frail old John. He's writing everything down. He's trying to take this all in. And it's only by the power of the Spirit that he's able to even understand some of these things. I mean, if it were me, I'd have just been laying in the corner sucking my thumb the whole time. And here John is there, and he's writing all these things down. And he's about to write because now, whoa, this is getting crazy. All this stuff is happening. Now a mighty angel comes down from heaven, and he goes and he cries as the voice of a lion. And then there's seven thunders in heaven, and they're calling out. And as he's about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. You know, that's when he, he puts that pen down. Okay. You know, imagine seven thunders from heaven. Do not write these things. Seal them up. Why? Why? Why all of a sudden? Why all of a sudden have we been getting all of this information and here now, potentially, what is Jesus or a mighty angel? And he's crying out, and these voices from heaven. And he says, seal it up. Why? Because we don't, and we cannot know everything. We don't know why. We don't know why. We don't know why then John didn't go back and not even put this stuff in here. He gives us a little bit of a taste of this experience, this encounter that he's having, but not all of the information. He could have left this whole part out. But this part he seals up. And it's interesting, and I've heard many say this, that, you know, so many, and you, you can read it, so many people try to speculate and to understand and to predict what it is that was said during this time. What is it that was sealed up? Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. Seal up what they said. The things that those things said. Yet we try to figure it out. And we're not going to know. We can't know. John is the only one, with the exception of God and the heavenly hosts, that know. John's the only one, and we don't know it. And so we should be careful with these things, because if you read stuff and you see what people are suggesting, that at the very best, it's speculation. Anything more than that, they're a false prophet, because we don't know. There are certain things we will not know until that time. And in verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand, raised up his hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. 
So here he says, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, this is the mighty angel that had come down from heaven. He raised up his hand to heaven and he swore by him, capital, who lives forever and ever. So this is where people get a little hung up on this. How can this be Jesus? How can this be Jesus if Jesus is Jesus, Son of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Jesus is, by virtue of that, creator as well. How can he swear by him who did all these things, who lives forever and ever? That wouldn't make sense, that it must be an angel because he's swearing on something that is bigger than him. He's swearing on God himself. Well, that could be true, but that very reasoning or logic would make sense for Jesus as well. Because if Jesus is going to swear on something or someone or some being, well then... That's it. It doesn't go any higher than that. That, yes, Jesus could swear on himself, right? I mean, he could. He could say, I swear on myself that these are the things which are about to happen, that there should be delay no longer. And so really, even with this, we could go either way. But this is where people a lot of times get hung up on thinking, well, maybe this is more of a mighty angel. Regardless of that, This mighty angel is standing there, arms to heaven, swearing that by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Now, some translations will read, if you've got an original King James Version, it likely says that there will be no more time. And the way that this is translated, it means that there will be no more delay, chronos, can be translated time or delay. We know that time doesn't make sense because following this chapter, we're going to have more description of time. There's going to be more indication of time, and that time does still have relevance. What's being communicated here, we believe, is that there's no more delay. No more delay in what? Well, we'll see that here shortly. And really what it is, is that there's no more delay in what God endeavors to do, that His plan is coming to a conclusion. That all of the events are unfolding, and though he has tarried, though he has been patient and long-suffering, that these things are now coming to an end. A lot of people today, a lot of critics, want to say, you Christians, you've been talking about Jesus coming back for 2,000 years. What's the deal? What's the deal with that? People want to be critical and they want to scoff because these Christians believe in something that's never going to happen. What did Peter say in 2 Peter 3? I'm going to read the whole chapter 3 here. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. And so I want you to sit here and I want you to think about what's going on in our world right now. And you think about all the events that are unfolding. And, and you may have asked this question too. How long, oh Lord? How long? You, know, you may be somebody who's gotten a lot more comfortable praying for Jesus' return. Bobby and I were talking about this earlier. I hope you're not just prepared, but that you're looking forward to it. By way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack, concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
You see, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He has made a promise and he is going to keep it. And there are scoffers in these last days who are going to live according to their own lust. They're going to willfully forget the prophecy that's been made. They're going to intentionally disregard what's been said within the word of God so that they can live according to their own lust. And they're going to look at Christians and they're going to say, you guys are crazy. You keep talking about Jesus coming back, but where is he? Where's the sign of his coming? Oh, where's the sign of his coming? It's all around us. And why? Why has he delayed? Because he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught, and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. This is great. We have a lot of these people today, untaught and unstable people, twisting the scriptures for their own benefit, for destruction. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. That there should be delay no longer. You see, we are reaching a point where, yes, he has delayed. He has delayed in his return. But we know, you go and you read prophecy scholars before 1948, what were they focused on? What did they need to happen? What were they looking for and trying to understand? When is this going to happen? Israel, the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel and people coming back into the land. 1948 happens. Whoa, now it's getting good. We're getting closer. Remember a day, that's 1948, but a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day. Then what happens in 1967? What does Israel recapture? The Western Wall. People are going back, the Jews are going back into Israel at at an unprecedented rate. Things are aligning. And here we sit today and we see these things related to North Korea. And we see the, the disgusting issues that are the hatred that's boiling up in cities around our country. And I mean, this, the list goes on and on. And what we can hope in today, Christian, as we read through this, is there is going to come a point when a mighty angel, whether it's an appointed angel or whether it's Jesus himself, is going to roar from the heavens with the sound of a lion and say, there will be no more delay. The time is coming. That needs to motivate us. That needs to get us excited. And here, as we reflect on what Peter says, is he says, I'm going to remind you. And so we should take comfort in that too, because sometimes we need to be reminded. And we can look back on the the early church and we can say, you know what, they needed some reminding too. And he reminds us of what we should look for. He reminds us, listen, don't doubt what God has promised. Don't forget what he has said. He's not slack in his promises. He's not going to forget. He's not going to not fulfill it. He's long-suffering. He's saying, please, figure it out. Get your lives on track. He's long-suffering, and so he encourages us, Peter encourages us to live our lives the way that God would desire for us to live them to the extent that we are able, spotless and blameless. 
And verse 7, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, so this is coming, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. You see, again, that time is now coming. We are getting to that place where the opportunity for repentance during the tribulation is coming to an end, and the bowls of wrath are going to be poured out, and the tribulation is going to come to an end. And we'll see the ushering in of the kingdom and the millennial reign. Now, what is the mystery? So he talks here about the mystery of God would be finished. We know that the seven thunders that spoke from heaven said, seal it up, seal it up. Imagine at the end of this, the angel says to John, and he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. We know because we're reading Revelation that we get it from him, right? He's taken off of Patmos and he's able to distribute the letter. How many people were asking him? What do the seven thunders say? Come on, come on, tell us. Tell us about it. Tell us about this mystery, that the mystery of God would be finished. We see throughout the Word, in particular here, the New Testament, Romans 11.25, that the ultimate conversion of the Jewish people is called a mystery. We see in Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 11, God's purpose for the church is called a mystery. The fullness of the Gentiles, Romans 11.25, is a mystery. The mystery of Christ, the gospel. The gospel is a fulfillment of prophecy and a mystery. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. The mystery. You see, many things in our faith, many things within the Word of God are a mystery to us, but it's at this time that things will be made known. Then the voice, verse 8, which I heard from heaven, spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. Give me the little book. So he was obedient, but I'd have been terrified. Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. Go walk up to this angel, this powerful angel, who basically said, it is finished. (laughs) And say, hey, give me that book. I'll take that now. You told me not to write. Don't write it. Seal it up. Don't tell anybody. Go take that book. (laughs) I mean, the poor John, right? He's just being, whew, this is intense stuff. This guy's going through a lot. And so we don't get to hear John's quaking voice. Of course, if this was Jesus, he would have been at peace with the command. But he says, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. What a strange command. Now, we've seen it before, right? Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. It's not the first time we've seen someone consume the Word of God. And it's believed that this little book is, in fact, and I would support this, that this is in some way, shape, or form the Word of God, whether it's the words that we read in Revelation, and so it's become the Word of God, or whatever variation it is, this is the Word. This is the plan of God. We don't know what's contained herein, but he says to eat it. He says to consume it, and when he does, it tastes sweet, but when it gets to his stomach, it's bitter. It doesn't feel so good once it goes down. And isn't that, in fact, the word sometimes? That as we read it, it can be sweet. It can be an incredible book, an amazing poem in many cases. You can read through Psalms and Proverbs, and and you can just be enamored with the words that you're reading. But at times, 
you get to a place where conviction really comes. And it doesn't necessarily feel so good. You can recognize here that as we go into chapter 10 and we can rejoice in the fact that this mighty angel says, there will be no more delay, that half of the people on the earth are dead already. That we can think about the Jewish unbelievers, those in Israel, and we can think about Israel and we can say we stand with Israel and we support Israel and we love Israel, but know that a third of them are going to survive. Two-thirds are going to be wiped out. That's bitter. That's a sweet word that's also bitter. But the additional implication for us here, especially as Christians, as we consider what John is being commanded to do and what we read in Ezekiel, is more about the fact that for us to be able to do these things, for us to be able to live, for us to consider the words of Peter as he says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As he says, live your lives in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. It's the reality for us that we cannot do that unless we consume the Word of God. It must be consumed. That's what this is telling us here, that for John, as he's about to get the commandment here that he needs to go and prophesy again about many peoples, is that it's the same thing as the call narrative for any other prophet out there, that you need to consume the Word of God. It needs to be in you. You need to be all about it. As we talked about on Sunday in the book of Acts, and we read of of Dorcas, Dorcas who was full of good works. The emphasis is not on the works simply for the sake of the works, but it's the fruit of salvation. It's the things that she did naturally because she was saved, because she believed, and so it began to consume her life. She did what she knew she needed to do to serve God. And in this same way, we need to be consuming this, every bit of it, devouring it. It's often said that somebody who devours a book, you just go right through it. You can't get enough of it. The thing is, is for every other book other than this one, you can read it. You know, some people, you have your favorite book and you've read it multiple times and you devour it, but there comes a point when it's done. It's done. You know, there's books I've gone back and read because there was just a lot there that I need to go back. And you know what? You know what I could do with those books is I could go and I could remember exactly where it was. And I could go and I could read it and I could write it down and say, okay, that was a great fact. I'm glad I went back to get that one. And you know what happens in this one? I know where I was at. I swear I know it was right there. But now it's telling me something totally different. It's speaking to me in a whole new way. Sometimes I can go back and find the verse and I think to myself, boy, that hit me differently last time. I'm just not reading it the same way this time, you know? And it wasn't that my exegesis is fundamentally different. But just that that was exactly what I needed at that particular moment, and the Holy Spirit used it to speak right to my heart. And the next time I go there, it's totally different. You can't get enough of this book. You can devour it all you want. You're never going to get to the end. And as sweet as it is, it's also bitter, those moments when it sinks into your stomach, and it's, ooh, ooh, that doesn't feel so good. That's what conviction is. That's what the truth of the Word is sometimes. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And so John is getting the command here that he's going to go and he's going to reflect on all the things that he's already done. Imagine John at this point, he's somewhere between 90 and 100 years old. He was on Patmos. He wanted to die. He wanted to die many times. And he didn't. And then here Jesus comes and he appears to him, and now he's having this this revelation, and it's becoming clear to him, no doubt, why he was spared for this time. And what he is seeing and what he's experiencing is absolutely incredible. But then he's being told, you're going to go and you're going to prophesy again. And he's got to be thinking, man, I got to keep going. I got to keep serving. And you know, it's so perfect. I heard somebody teaching on this particular point about this particular verse, and you wouldn't normally, I mean, you could think about this, but if you think about the age that John is here at this point, and now he's being given additional ministry, and we could just leave it at that, but the thing that struck me as I was studying for that this week, and I read this particular commentary, is I thought to myself about Sunday, Sunday morning with the youth standing up here. There was a theme with the youth, was there not? There was something that none of them wanted to do. None of them wanted to work with the old people. And I praise God that they had to work with the old people. 
They're going to think I'm just being relentless, and I am. I'm just going to continue to pray and pray and pray that they would be so ridiculously uncomfortable, so stretched, I think it's perfect for them. But here's what I also thought about. Why is that so uncomfortable for them? Why is that so foreign to them? You know, there's part of it that is just, you know, going into a nursing home or whatever is, you know, it's, it's maybe not always the most pleasant experience, but there's a challenge that needs to come back on each and every one of us as well. Because what it speaks to is that there is a fundamental cultural gap that exists today of ages. In the past, one, the nursing home really didn't exist, and individuals aged right in the home with the rest of the family. That ability to interact, there was nothing strange about that. It was grandma or grandpa or whomever was right in the home. And there was a level of comfort that was developed with it. But there was also a great deal of knowledge that was shared. There was a great deal of respect that was developed. We have lost so much of the family unit today because of those things. And so while, yes, I want to kick those youth in the butt and say, get right back in there and you get comfortable with it. And if any of you are going to go to Ethiopia with us next year, I'm going to make sure you're in the most uncomfortable spot when you get there because it's good for us, right? I won't say that at the informational meeting. We're going to suck them in. It's going to be like a timeshare presentation. Oh, this is great, you know, and then we'll get them after they sign on the dotted line. They need to do that. But here's the other thing. Just like John, 90 years old, 100 years old, and this mighty angel saying to him, you're up again. And so every one of us, now I'm not there yet. The Lord has to do with me what he has to do with me and use me in the way that he needs to use me. But if you're advancing in years, you need to listen to that same thing. And you need to say, how do I engage? How do I engage? How do I participate in this such that I can bridge that gap, such that I can make them more comfortable, that perhaps in, in five years from now or 10 years from now, we don't have any youth that are standing up there saying, hey, I was uncomfortable with this because it's natural. Because there is such a dynamic that exists within our congregation that young and old, it doesn't matter. We're doing ministry together. We're teaching one another. We're learning together. We are doing what we can to model what it is to be the church. Amen? And I look at this and I think, my goodness. It was Joe Foch who said this. He said, and I'm not going to quote him properly, but it doesn't matter if you're 70 or 80 or you're 90, you're never out. Ministry is never over. And here we have such an example of an individual who's about to prophesy again to many people's nations, tongues, and kings. we got to look at that and we should be encouraged that in whatever amount of time that the Lord will tarry, that there's still work to do. Each and every single one of us, doesn't matter, that the Lord can still use us. He can still put us to work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word, which is sweet, it can be bitter at the same time, Lord, as we experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit as we are sobered by the reality of things that may come to those who do not believe. But Lord, conviction is good. Being uncomfortable is good. It prompts us to more. It propels us on. And Lord, as we've read here tonight, we recognize that there will come a time when the mighty angel will stand on the land and the sea and will declare that there will be no more delay. That the time for this life is coming to an end. That the opportunity for repentance is winding down. And so, Lord, I pray that within each of us there would be such a sense of urgency to form bonds, to develop relationships, to make connections, Lord, and to ultimately share the gospel of Jesus Christ with anyone, Lord, who may not have received it and believed on it and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Help us, Lord, to be about the work of making disciples of Christ. And as we see here with John, Lord, what an encouragement and so many within the Bible, those who were faithful till the very end, those who truly finished well. Lord, it's my prayer for each of these here, myself included, Lord, that we would finish well, that we would never miss an opportunity, that we would take advantage of every open door, that we would seek to glorify you in all things. And specifically for this body, Lord, for this church, as we've talked about even the, the dynamic of ages, Lord, I pray that we could be, it's nothing new, it's not unique. So Lord, help us to be something that is. Help us to be a body that, that is unique in that way, to bridge that gap. 
to do something, Lord, that could be a, an example to others. Father, continue to work in our lives, I pray. Move in our midst here. Bless each of these here, Lord, as they follow after you and work in this body of believers, Lord. I thank you for them. I pray for your blessing upon them. And Lord, continue to give us understanding of your word that we might apply it, Lord, biblically, scripturally in our lives, Lord. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you thanks. Be with us, Lord, throughout the rest of this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.